Well, now we're going to take a look at uh, the move out in a t-squared x-squared coordinate system. We've already talked about the behavior, the, re the reflection response uh, in, in time versus source receiver offset x. And we found that this time distance relationship was hyperbolic. We also noted that if we take the square of the time and plot that versus the square of the distance, that we get a linear relationship between t squared and x squared. So in the t squared x squared coordinates, we have t squared is equal to x squared over b1 squared. Plus, and we're just dealing with a single reflector here, plus 4h squared over v1 squared. We know that this is basically the square of 2h over v1, which and 2h over v1 is just t0. So we have that uh, t squared is equal to x squared over v1 squared plus t0 squared. And the delta t squared then would just be this term right here, x squared over v1 squared. So. The slope, if we take a look at the slope of the t squared x squared response for this reflection from a layer with approximately constant velocity, uh, we have a slope of 1 over uh, the nmo squared. This uh, v squared then is just delta x squared over delta t squared. And the v nmo, the normal move out velocity then, would be equal to the square root of delta x squared over delta t squared. So we're just taking the square root of the reciprocal of the slope in order to get this velocity. And that's often referred to as the move out velocity. So if we, we have this simple model, but we're going to look at two reflections now. So we have a reflection from the uh, near surface layer, the layer with a velocity of 2,000 meters per second. And then we have a Another reflection event with, uh, from the base of a layer that has a velocity of 4,000 meters per second. And we should come back and for a second at least review some basic ideas here is that the reflection from the base of this upper layer here is going to be, its asymptote is going to be the, asymptote is going to be the direct arrival which runs out along the surface. So we would have a direct arrival that comes down and parallels the reflection event and long offsets. The asymptote for the reflection from the base of layer 2, of course, is, um, is going to have a different asymptote. Uh, but nonetheless, it will be asymptotic to, to um, the, the hyperbolic reflection response will uh, converge uh, asymptotically on uh, an asymptote which has a slope which will actually be different from the interval, interval velocity. And we can see that uh, very nicely over here. You know, we have this simple, simple model. Now, if we transform the, uh, you know, if we transform this into t squared x squared uh, coordinates, we get these two straight lines. In the case of the reflection from the base of the upper layer, we can see that we have a perfectly straight line. I don't know if you can see the trend line, which is fit to the t squared x squared uh, response for the reflection from the base of, or from horizon 1. But it parallels quite nicely, overlays quite nicely. Now for the reflection from horizon 2, the base of layer 2, we can see that um, this response is not perfectly straight. So there's a little bit of deviation. We can see that the trend line goes a little bit above over this part of the curve, a little bit below over this part of the curve. Now take a look at these uh, equations here and uh, think about what these terms represent. This constant here, remember, would be 1 over v nmo squared. This constant here would be the intercept time squared. Same down here, this would be the uh, reciprocal of the nmo velocity for the reflection from the base of layer 1. And this would be its t0. Take the square root of that to get t0. Now you can see up here we, we did note that the correlation or the goodness of fit r squared, the correlation coefficient r. So it was a little bit less than 1 and you can kind of see that here where it's perfectly equal to 1 here for the reflection from the base of horizon 1. So 
things work out quite well, we do get straight lines if the velocity is relatively constant and the intervals are relying a, a reflection. But it doesn't quite work out for uh, intervals uh, or an average velocity, if you will, that differs from the interval velocity. So uh, again, just coming back and thinking about these constants, uh, the square root of the reciprocal of the slope of the reflection from horizon 1, that's this one. This would be the square root of the reciprocal of the slope. The slope here is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 7 second squared per meter squared. If we take the uh, square root of the reciprocal there, we get 2,000 meters per second, which is exactly the interval velocity in this layer. However, for the square root of the reciprocal, the slope of the reflection, t squared x squared response for, for the reflection from the base of layer 2, for horizon 2, uh, that turns out to give us a velocity which is 3,311 meters per second. So this is actually less than the interval velocity. Uh, and you, you probably would not have expected it to be equal to this interval velocity. But this, this uh, velocity here, for, for the present, we'll just refer to that as the move-out velocity. And this move-out velocity represents some sort of a, a, an average, average velocity. It turns out to be, we can think of it as kind of a weighted average, uh, velocity of the uh, velocity, velocities of the layers overlying the reflection event. So, um, if we take a look at the correction, now the correction uh, would be applied, we'd apply the correction to the x squared t squared responses. And the corrected time would be, tau would be referred to as the corrected time. Uh, assuming that tau is a little bit different than t0, might, might be a little bit different than t0 if the correction velocity is not uh, very accurate. So we take a look at that. Look, look at that here. We've got uh, tau squared is equal to t squared plus delta t squared minus the square of the correction term. The correction term, of course, is minus x squared over v n m o squared. This was x squared over v actual squared, and uh, so we get this residual here, this tau squared. And we went through the solution. We we use the constants that we had derived from the trend line. You can imagine doing this with uh, actual data. So we found that the NMO velocity for the reflection from the base of layer 1 turned out to be exactly equal to the interval velocity, whereas in the case of the reflection from the base of uh, layer 2, horizon 2, we get a velocity which differs significantly from the interval velocity, either one of the interval velocities or the interval velocity in layer 2. We get uh, uh, a velocity of a correction velocity of 3,311 meters per second. These should be square roots. This is uh, should be VNMO. So we're taking the square root of that. Sorry about that. Um, so there we go. We've taken the square root of the uh, slope terms here. And um, the, the reciprocal of the square root of the slope to get the NMO velocities, 2,000 meters per second and 3,311 meters per second. So the delta t, we have a, a delta t squared would be, uh, the correction term would be x squared over VNMO1 squared for reflection 1, and then it would be um, 1 over VNMO2 squared, x squared over VNMO2 squared for the correction term. Uh, for the reflection from horizon 1. Now you can see these reflections at this scale, they look, uh, they look very flat, they look flat to me, but as we noted earlier on, there, this uh, best fit or this trend line here uh, rises above this line. So this line is not perfectly, perfectly flat. We do have a little bit of residual uh, move out that we haven't uh, uh, taken care of in this using this approach to the uh, correction. Uh, let's also take a look at the derived values of T0. Um, they reveal some interesting features as well. The T0s would be this 
square roots of these terms. These would be the t0 squared. So if we take the uh, uh, square root of this, uh, we get uh, 0.1 seconds, so that's uh, exact. But the trend, trend line value for t0 2 uh, 0.255 seconds differs from the calculated value of 0.25 by 0 0.005 seconds, five, 5 milliseconds basically. So it's a small amount, but it shows you once again that this best fit line here, that this uh, t squared x squared representation of the reflection from the base of layer two is not a perfectly straight line. So, and you can also see this again, as, as we noted earlier in the goodness of fit, r squared 0.997 uh, rather than one, as it is in the case for horizon one. And the basic reason, and we'll have to come back to this later on, is that the reflections from multiple layers are slightly non-hyperbolic. So unless you're dealing with a layer with almost a constant velocity, uh, the reflection response will not be perfectly hyperbolic. So reflection, the reflection response is actually, uh, to be accurate, is, is slightly non-hyperbolic. And uh, so this is probably a, you know, a fairly good illustration of um, some of the subtlety in that, uh, in that distinction there. So, for horizon one, again, we had this constant velocity. We just had a single velocity. We get a perfect correction here. We're looking at a condensed uh, time scale in this case. And uh, so this is perfectly flat. And we're, you know, we'd be very happy with that. However, with the uh, corrected uh, arrival times for the reflection from horizon two, you can see that we do have a sag in here in the uh, t squared, t squared, x squared uh, coordinate system. Uh, this is well this is tx squared so we're looking at uh, time varying linearly here but we're looking at uh, source receiver offset uh, squared so you can see that uh, we do get this sag in here so from the bottom to the from the from the minimum to the max we have uh, you know a little over 10 milliseconds of uh, delta t now you know, we might normally think, well, that's really a pretty small difference. We can kind of ignore that as we saw in the previous graph. It really doesn't amount to much. But uh, when we're talking about the seismic wavelet, that could be a big difference. And we'll be talking about stacking and, and those other, uh, you know, another process that, that, that uh, uh, gets applied later on when we do common midpoint sorting. But for now, We've got these two plots. This is in tau, the corrected time versus x. And you can see again here in linear t and x that uh, we do have this sag in here. So this reflection event uh, in a multi-layer system uh, is actually non-hyperbolic. Uh, some of the deviation from hyperbolic, its hyperbolic form is, you know, you might think we could ignore that, but you know, 10 milliseconds is not really something that you could ignore in the processing stream. So does a much better job but uh, then the series approximation that we looked at before which failed miserably but it, it still leaves uh, some residual move out in the reflection from from the, the uh, base of layer two so here uh, just you know taking a look uh, at what we've done we're just going to take a look at the one event where we can assume that the velocity we're we're justified in assuming that the velocity, the NMO velocity is almost equal to the inner, the average interval velocity, let's say. We calculate the corrected time. This is T0 squared plus, and then we have these two terms in here. This is X squared over V actual squared minus X squared over the normal move out. This would be your estimated velocity squared. So that if, if the VNMO is equal to V, exactly equal to V, then these two terms are going to cancel out. We get tau squared is equal to T0 squared plus X squared over V squared minus X squared over VNMO squared. And since these two velocities are equal, this is just equal to T0 squared. So we've done a perfect job. And, you know, we can be, we can be uh, very happy with ourselves. But uh, next time what we're going to consider is, well, what if we get it wrong? What if the normal move out velocity is slightly different than the actual velocity? Maybe it's a little bit higher, maybe it's a little bit lower. 
So we're going to ignore uh, the non-hyperbolic move out in that discussion and we're just going to focus on what happens to this corrected time here if the velocity is a little bit too high or a little bit too low. What will the corrected um, reflection response look like? And remember, we're trying to get it to look like geology. So if we just back up for a second, I've kind of run over time. But this is kind of misleading in the sense that it indicates that you might have a little, you know, in your shot record there, you might have uh, a little syncline in there. This is a very subtle one, but some sort of a sag in this particular horizon, which would be misleading. So the next time we're going to take a look at uh, some other ways that you can end up with apparent features in the corrected response that are not, do not provide you with an accurate depiction of the geometry of the layers that you're imaging. So thanks again for, uh, for joining us and talk to you next time.